underage persons will not be allowed to vote in 2023. Director of Voter Education and Publicity, INEC Victor Aluko, says as CSOs seek sanctions against underage voting ahead of 2023 election. And we're working to reconcile with G5, Okowa says, as PCC spokesperson insists Wiki's non-support won't affect Atiku's chances. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anakom. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has insisted that no underage persons will be allowed to vote in the forthcoming 2023 general elections. The commission also reiterated its assurance to the Nigerian electorate that citizens who have yet to attain a legal voting age will not be allowed to participate in the polls. The chairman, Transitioning Monitoring Group, uh, Awal Musa, uh, has also called on Nigerians to be vigilant and ready to defend democracy. A Affirming that the threat to 2023 general elections is real. He said that while Nigerians are preparing to exercise their civic rights in electing leaders that will solve the myriads of challenges confronting the country, some politicians are scheming to stop election or ensure the poll is not free, fair and credible. Well, joining us today as we speak on civic education and voter education, we have Abanuo Nathaniel, he's the Executive Director of Reboost Community Advancement Initiative. And we also have joining us Paul James, he's the Head of Elections, Yaga Africa. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you very much, Mary. Great. Um, no better group of persons to have this conversation with than you who are obviously on the ground doing a lot of work in terms of educating the people and, of course, those who have been monitoring the elections. But I, I'll start with you, Abamo. Um, you obviously seem like a grassroots person and you work with people uh, in communities. Um, the issue of multiple underage voter registration came back up uh, in the news recently because of concerns that have been raised. But the beautiful part of it is that the people in the north are seemingly the ones who have raised this alarm, as opposed to those who are onlookers who see these things happening and ask that INEC wade into the matter. But uh, my question is, why does INEC have to wait for us? Or should I say, do we have to tell INEC that we do not want underage voters, as opposed to INEC making sure, as they go through the process of cleaning the register, that this doesn't happen in 2023? Well, I thank you very much. Um, I think uh, the position of the law is clear as to who um, should be registered to be eligible to vote. And as we know, the age of the teens is also paid for that. And um, the first question we need to ask ourselves, how do the people get into the process? That is one of the concerns we the raise. It starts from the process of registration. And part three of the electoral act is very clear as to who does the registration and keeps and maintains the voters register. That is solely the responsibility of INA. So for those underage children to find their way into the register is a thing of concern. And we must also raise this so that we cannot repeat what happened in 2019, where we have plenty on the voters showing up to vote. And of course, now, even at the election day, why would an electoral officer allow an election to be in the first place? Since they are finding their way into the register, I think it's something that uh, we also need to begin to look at critically. Yes, the voters register according to INEC has been clean. Does this entail uh, the underhand voters? Or is it the only issues of government expressions that are taken care of? And if we go into 2023 elections, 
you should begin to look at how to have a credible uh, voter registration, a, a voter register that can do clearly who is um, serving be the responsibility of choosing the next day. So if we continue this way, I think we are also heading for us what happened in 2019, where we still have children who are less than 15 years still voting. So obviously is a thing of concern, and then we need to look at this critically. Thank you. Person. The reason why I started with you and asked that question is because of the issue of, you know, these young persons, these underage voters are from communities and the people who are lining up side by side them are also from their communities. They know them. They know that they're too young to be voting. Uh, as much as INEC has its job cut out for it, what role should communities be playing in making sure that even though INEC is doing what it can, um, they also make sure that this does not recur? Yeah. Um... Can you, can you please come over the question again? I'm saying as community and grassroots people, you obviously, the, these young people who are on the age, who line up to vote on election day are from your communities. And I'm saying, what, what is the role of community members and people, CSOs like you at the grassroots, uh, to make sure that this doesn't recur, even though INEC has his job cut out for it? Yes. Um, the focus thing is the sensitization of Electorate. So, um, to let them know one the implications of having an unfair voters, but um, making their way into the democracy. And um, uh, our, our part is more of education and sensitization. But however, the political class also have their own way of getting those people into the voter analysis. And this is what we are, uh, you know, uh, advocating for. Now, you, we are uh, governing the voter register, we are going to go to the communities and uh, sensitize these people to see a need why they should or, 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 or get on the register voters. But our duty also does not impose who become, who, who find his way there. However, it's the root, is 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 um, is the duty of the INA officials. We this same set of people present themselves to, to the register. Because we may not be there when they come in to register. Our job is do community mobilization, do community okay. sensitization, ensure that the people are, 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 are out to, 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 to the register. All right. This is what we are able within the communities. All right, let me go to Paul. Paul, um, just take it from where he, he stopped. Um, like I asked, he... There's a role that INEC plays, of course. INEC is supposed to do thorough, a thorough job in making sure that the people who are registered are not under eight. But again, uh, I asked a question about the people who live amongst them because, of course, we're all asking for free, fair, credible elections and we all have a role to play. But he did say something about the fact that the, it's also the duty of politicians and political parties. But if it's beneficial to me that young people who are under age are casting their votes for me, why would I want to wade in? Exactly. I think uh, the first point to note here is that elections and their outcomes are largely dependent on the electorates and not necessarily on the politicians. As much as sometimes the politicians are the beneficiaries of this outcome, it is the people that get to vote. It is also the people that go to register. Now, I have followed through the process of the voter registration since it started in uh, June of last year up until uh, the end, sometimes in August of this year. And I can tell you, based on the findings by Yaga Africa, in most of these locations where we observe, you rarely can find party agents at those locations. You see individuals, you see young people, you see INEC officials that are administering the process of the registration. And so the parties get to benefit by the time that process is concluded. Is that what we want to be said in our election? No, not necessarily. And then that is why INEC on this part is beginning to say you can actually tie this underage registration to some of their dubious officials that allow it to happen. And so we wait on INEC to see what INEC is going to be about this and also to make a point that uh, underage registration is even more complicated because I heard them mention things about deleting uh, records from the register. It is easier to delete multiple registrations 
than to delete underage registration because based on the INET guideline, especially for the process of uh, uh, hearing claims and objection, if you have any objection to make, for instance, on the basis that someone is underage or someone is diseased, then the only source of proof is on the person that is making the claim. The person has to bring a birth certificate, the person has to bring a death certificate. That is even what makes it complicated. Mm. And also to make the point that most of this underage registration that we are seeing now, uh, most of them are even from the 2019 registration. Uh, it is becoming more pronounced now. People are making more noise about it now because of the opportunity that technology presents. Most of these are, if you like, um, on the electronic version of the register that INEC has submitted online. That is where people are drawing most of the conclusions from. But then we thank technology because, of course, if you want to have the credibility of the electoral process begins to a large extent from the quality of the voter register. And so I think it's a step in the right direction. But then I also wait to see how the claims and objections, especially on the underage voters, will pan out. We expect INEC will do a thorough job there. And then we we'll also expect at the end that we'll have a good register for the election. Moving away from that, let's talk about something that the chairman of the TMG uh, raised a concern. He said something uh, in the line that um, he accused politicians uh, generally for creating in uh, insecurity to justify the looting of our public coffers. And this is not the first time you and I would be hearing that there are certain politicians, governors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who might be uh, behind the election, pre-election violence, even election violence, and of course, all of the insecurity that we're seeing across the country. Um, wh where do we even start to deal with this kind of issue? Because being that these are people who are in power, who um, the law actually empowers to make sure that we are protected from all of these insecurities that are happening. But then, if we're hearing um, that these people are the perpetrators of the insecurity, um, where do we go from here? I think I share the same concern because um, in recent past, some of the observations we have made about election-related violence is that you can tie them to these politicians, especially in the build-up to election. I think one of the things we are beginning, the, the new trend we are beginning to see, is the weaponization of violence. If you go back to the Edo election that happened in 2020, as well as the Ondo election, based on the observer reports we got in the pre-election phase. 18 local governments in Ondo State, 13 of 18 local governments were living with different shades of pre-election violence. The same also in Ondo, different kinds of pre-election related violence. If you also go to the Anambra election, if you remember, there was also the case of, um, uh, of course, the, uh, the non-state actors that were insisting the election was not even going to hold in that region, which to some extent even we thought had some political coloration because you cannot even imagine, for instance, we wanted to hold a, an engagement with the traditional institutions in Anand Brasset at some point. They had to cancel that engagement because of the threats by the or no, uh, by, by the non-state actors. This is even how powerful that they have become. And so we are seeing that also crippling in even as we plan for the 2023 election. The sense we are getting in this is that politicians will put so much fear in the minds of the voters so that voters don't get to even go out to engage the process. And then, um, I mean, events of the past have also shown that it is where voters don't get to go out that politicians manipulate the process. So they try to where you have a, a low turnout and then get to engage or manipulate the process. But then the, on the flip side also is even the engagement by security agencies. Mm. If you look at the trend also that has been happening, most of the security agencies will wait until very close to the election before they begin to do what they call show of force. That happened in Edo, that happened in Odo, and even all the other elections in recent times. They wait until the week of the election before they come in with their gadgets, they come in with the manpower and all of that. And for any voter that has seen the threats before election, of course, you want to value the life first before you think about it in the electionary process. So I think that has been the challenge. If we want to do an engagement here, I think it has to be a robust engagement that is timely, that is all to commence, that commences early. For instance, we already know where some of these concerns are. What sort of security mapping is happening already? Mm. What sort of assurance are the security agencies giving the voters that their lives and properties will be protected even as they go out to exercise their fundamental rights? So I think those are the kind of conversations we need to have 
begin to have now. 90 days is not too long from now. Mm -hmm. um, we are also already seeing some improvement actually in the security, uh, from the security architecture and also in the management of some of the security crisis. But how long will that continue? The biggest threat even in this election is the attack that we are beginning to see on INET. In recent time, we saw the attack that happened in Oshun, we saw the attack that happened in Oyo. How long will that continue? How long, uh, how also is that going to affect planning for INEC? I think that should be the, uh, the goal of contention. That should be mm. the biggest preoccupation for everybody going forward. Mm. That should be m the biggest priority. But I'm going to come back to you, but let me go to uh, Nathaniel. Um, the the Oh, I think uh, we lost uh, Nathaniel's connection there. So I'm going to stay with you, um, Paul. Now, the presidential candidate of the Action Alliance, uh, Major Hamzat Al Mustafa, retired, had raised an alarm on the issue of arms proliferation. And I remember five, six, if not eight years ago, when I started reporting on guns and ammunition finding its way into the center of the country before half the time, you know, they're being discovered. Um, one of the most interesting ones was the one that was, you know, um, um, stopped in South Africa uh, on its way to Nigeria. Um, we, we, at some point, we heard that they were, they were coming from Israel, but then that was the end of the story. We remember the ones that soldiers had to, you know, um, stop somewhere in the middle of town. It had gone through clearance, um, through customs. It came into the country. The biggest question is, who are importing these guns? Where are the guns going to? Have we gotten to hear the last when it comes to these arms and ammunitions that are being brought into the country every other day? Because um, Mr. Mustafa is saying that these might be a threat in the 2023 elections. Interesting question there. Um, this is also based on the fact that as part of the prevention assessment by Young Africa, we have a question where we track the uh, build up, especially in gathering of arms and life reports by politicians and also the recruitment of political talks. This is not even a recent phenomenon. If you go back also to other elections, there has always been this concern of gathering of arms and life reports. Again, I go back to Ondo, I go back to Edo in 2020. It was a big issue in those two elections. Now, this also brings the concern, I mean, bring to fore the concern about our borders. Our borders are so porous. The last time I think that President was engaged on the concerns about people bringing in ammunition, he raised a complaint about what has happened in Libya and also that Nigeria was suffering the devastating effect of that. He blamed the West and the likes for, for that. But then beyond that is what sort of uh, intelligence gathering is happening in the country? We are already in so much crisis that we cannot allow this to continue to fester. So I will say that could be right. He has been in the security cycle, and of course, he may have more information than I have at my disposal. But to what extent also is he engaging with the powers that be, with the security agencies, to see how we can mop up this? For instance, when we did the ocean election in uh, observation that happened sometimes in June, July this year, I remember in our engagement with uh, Justin Babatunde Kukuma, who was the BIT in charge of the election, we raised those concerns about some part of the states. What we had about the build up of arms and also uh, like weapons. He promised us that they were going to do that uh, more, more because, of course, we had provided information at that point in time. So that is what I expect. If we're hearing this, engage with the appropriate authorities. If they fail to act, then we can take them off from there. Well, um, Al Mustafa was at an event. Apparently, um, he was. Um at uh, a roundtable discussion with the theme contemporary security challenges and their effects to the 2023 general election. Now, I'd like to quote something that he said again. He said, as of today, all agencies in Nigeria, and I'm sure the representative of the IG of police is here, if he's aware of what I'm t going to talk about, new discoveries of movements of drugs, arms, coming into the country through numerous borders in large quantities. He says, I'm talking of it now as I speak, but I'm sure society... Is not aware because you said that you might not be privy to some of the information he has. He's a former, um, you know, general in the army, so he has he's privy to some of this information. Now I want to talk about immigration and customs. Now for customs, they 
gladly now tell us how much money they've generated you know every year they seem to be more interested in income generation as opposed to their duty immigration on the other hand are interested in inducements as opposed to the duty of protecting our borders so again can this just be what's just you know fall on the back of a chicken and we'll just talk about it because it's election season as opposed to people doing their jobs is there any repercussion for not doing jobs rightly in this country if there be any why is it not taking force I think it's a failure of sanction here. Yeah. It's not like we don't know these issues or we also don't know where these problems are emanating from. For this sort of uh, concern to be raised by somebody that I think is highly connected, especially from the security uh, cycle, it tells you how grievous this thing is. It's just about where we are going to see the, uh, the will uh, from whoever is I mean, the head of these agencies to ensure that we see some sort of action, especially as we are headed into the thick of the election season. It is sad that this is happening and we are making more clear of it. It is sad that our our borders, especially the poorest nature of our borders, have become topics for discussion almost in every cycle that you go to. So I think it's just to leave it at the doorstep of the security agencies, but also as uh, civil society organization are also actors in this space to continue to draw me to them on the need to ensure they provide that protection that is needed as people continue to engage the process. Let's talk about IDPs. I, I mean, we can't talk about the elections without bringing the issue of IDPs here. We have about 2 million plus, if I'm not um, mistaken, in Benue, just in Benue. We have IDPs everywhere. I just, I just realized we also have IDPs in, in Edo State. And they spread all about. Um, I've spoken to INEC about this before, and they said, oh, these people can be captured. Um, but, but what is the fate of these people? Being that, okay, we've also had the issue of floodings that has also misplaced people. How is INEC going to cover this, and will it have an adverse effect on the elections and how it, the outcome? Sadly, it might, but I know there have been some high level conversation within the INEC cycle. Um, on the way to mainstream the people in the IDP camps. They have done that in 2019, where they conducted election in the camps. So I, I expect that it's going to be a similar arrangement. I know there has been a conversation about the framework, uh, legal framework that will allow INEC to be able to, to do that. INEC has done a lot of the mappings. Not only, not only Benue and Edo, we have still, we still have IDPs in Medjugorje, for instance, but most of we have IDPs now also in Koji State and the like. So I know those mappings have been done by INEC, and there's also a commitment on the part of INEC to ensure an inclusive process. So as the days unfold, I mean, we hope to see whatever plan that INEC has for them as the days unfold, but I think they will go back with the plan as they did the last time of hosting, I mean, uh, they are hosting polling units in the IDP camps and conducting elections in those camps. I anticipate that it's going to be the same uh, modus operandi this time around. Uh, finally, let's talk about we the people, because you see, when we're doing this civic education, it's not necessarily for politicians, it's for us, the people. Now, the average person right now is being taken by the campaigns where my candidate is better than your candidate, or I support this person or not. You know, the, the, the intrigues and, you know, the theatrics is what's the other, the, even the papers are joining in the party, and that seems to be the headline. Um, but what should we, the people, be focusing our attention and what should be the conversations that we're having right now um, as we speak. Nathaniel, I see that you're back, but um, Paul, if you can quickly answer that, what should be, um, you know, headlining the conversations that we're having as opposed to uh, the jaw-drawing and the warring over this candidate and that candidate? I think it's to go back to even how we started. If we recall on this, September 28th, when uh, the party, uh, our primary started official, our party campaign started officially. There was the peace signing agreement, which was supposed to be symbolic. The parties committed to ensuring a, a peaceful uh, campaign process. So, I mean, if you also understand the spirit and the latter beyond all of that, and the kind of the caliber of individuals that were assembled in that room where that event held, of course, you know that everybody think uh, peace is, uh, is paramount and also. Uh, the need for a should be a should based campaign as the politicians engage. Of course, uh, they think uh, it is through this sensational engagement 
through this rhetoric of hate speech, misinformation, and all of that, that they think they will survive in the murky waters of our politics. So our perhaps is to begin to send that reminders to them. I know INEC, for instance, is coming up with a document that will spell out um, the penalties for engaging in all of this. It's not like, like we don't have those already. The laws are there, but of course, sometimes you need to be reminding them. The IGP has also strongly come out to warn against that. So I want to see sanction now. I want to see that they begin to pick some of these politicians so that it will serve as lesson for others and will help also to sanitize the process going forward. All right, finally, let me come back to you, uh, Amuniwa. Uh, I think we, you went off um, for a bit. If you're there, c c can you hear me, Nathaniel? Nathaniel, can you hear me? I think well, we lost that <laughs> we lost that connection again. Okay, finally, Paul. Before we go, um, there are people who are saying that um, INEC might reopen its registration, um, you know, process. Many people have complained about the fact that they had moved or uh, changed their polling units to some place that is closer, some transferred. Um, but then now that they're looking through the register. They don't see anything. They don't see their names. It looks like um, that registration or that change of location has become invalid. But looking at the time that we have between now and the election season, uh, can INEC address all of these issues in time and update the voter regist uh, voters register for February? Of yes. Is it possible to update the register, especially for transfers? The guideline, uh, the guide, INX guideline says transfers can be done up to 60 days before an election. Mm -hmm. If you look at the window we have, we still have like 90 days before the election. So I think in the next 30 days, whoever wants to do the transfer can initiate the process of that transfer and also follow with their electoral officers through the INEC uh, resident electoral commissioners in their different states and ensure that they get this done. As for the extension for the voter registration process, the law is very clear that the process should end 90 days to the election. As it is now, we have like uh, either 91 or 92 days until that election. We all have been the advocates for INEC to extend the timing for this, but INEC has also come up with its own reasons why it needed to stop at some point. This is the biggest election ever, over 93 million, according to INEC, that they have registered so far. And that will need to clean up the register. That's why we're doing display claims and objection now. And that will need to produce voters that at the end of the cleaning up exercise. Let us not forget that. It is after this display claims and objection that I will, clear, will produce the last batch of the voters' uh, card before they start the distribution of the voters' card and then begin to plan for the election. I think we should allow INEC the time. We should allow INEC also to, uh, to operate within what it thinks is feasible. I don't think there is any need for this unnecessary distractions at this point in time. Well, Paul James is of Yaga, Africa. Paul, always a pleasure to have you uh, have these conversations with you. Thank you very much, Mary, for the invitation. Thank all you. Right. Thank I you. appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll continue our discussion on the PDP and its internal struggles. As we speak, uh, the G5 governors are in Umahia kicking off, of course, uh, the governorship campaigns out there. We'll talk with a representative of the People's Democratic Party after this break.